Well, good afternoon. It's uh, wonderful to be here with everyone uh, to look at where Christ walked. Um, and for those that uh, have not been uh, involved with the gospel message, this is a wonderful opportunity to learn some things about the hope that God has provided for his creation and for uh, the members here to be built up in looking at these things that we believe and to see actually where Christ walked, where he was raised, where he performed his miracles. And so we can start out with a, a short video. You may have seen this. It was at the Museum of Science on Jerusalem. And it will give us a little bit of an overview of the land of Israel. At the crossroads of history, forged by centuries of conflict, is a place once believed to be the center of the world. Jerusalem. National Geographic Entertainment invites you to explore a land cherished by billions for the first time on the world's largest screens. Experience this ancient city through the stories of people who call it home. A mosaic of cultures and beliefs. ancient rituals secrets buried deep underground Jerusalem so that's a nice little introduction for us, and you may have noticed the flashlights there. That's Hezekiah's tunnel, and you can uh, walk through that and go on a tour. We're going to begin our travels through the land of Israel in this spot here where it's generally believed that Christ gave the Sermon on the Mount. And if you can imagine, uh, the day that I was there, it was uh, 85 degrees and warm and a wind that just was kind of whipping through. And you're looking down over the Sea of Galilee. We can imagine the multitudes there gathered before Christ as he is teaching as no man has ever taught before and bringing things to the mind of the earth and God's creation that had never been heard before. And so Christ standing in this spot in Matthew 5 begins, and seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he had, was set, his disciples came unto him and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on an hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And so these wonderful teachings of Christ of the kingdom of God coming to the earth, that those that are meek will be blessed, and that the earth is the reward provided to those who seek after God. And how many people Christ helped this day by giving those healing words, that message of hope. And as we move down in the same area a little bit lower, you can see the Sea of Galilee in the distance there as well. And this is generally 
the wonderful miracle of Christ feeding the 5,000. And that account is in Matthew, verse 13. When Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place, a pot, and when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a desert place, and the time is now past. Send the multitude away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. But Jesus said unto them, They need not depart. Give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, We have here but five loaves and two fishes. He said, Bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took the five loaves and the two fishes, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and brake, and gave the loaves to his disciples, and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat, and were filled, and they took up of the fragments that remained twelve baskets full. And they that had eaten were about five thousand men, beside women and children. And so Christ here at this miracle provided for the natural needs of the, of the people that had come to listen to him that day. But we know that Christ is the bread of life from heaven who came down to earth, who who came and was born on earth and provides the true life to his believers. And he provides that food that will be eternal life for those that follow after him. This is a, a, um, if we were to look up in this area over here, Uh, we would have the Jordan River flowing into the Sea of Galilee. And uh, it's a wonderful area of families that are around that are uh, just on the Sabbath. They spend time, they have cookouts, and they enjoy the uh, family time and uh, celebrating just being uh, together and enjoying uh, their time in the land of Israel. And so we we were up in this area for the Sermon on the Mount, and we're going to travel as well to where Christ would have been, uh, roughly where he would have been baptized, and then this empties into uh, the Sea of Galilee. Just a few guys hanging out. We know this is a fishing area, and just uh, relaxing and trying to catch some fish. I had lunch in this spot, and it was just uh, fantastic to be uh, take a swim and to uh, be, be in the land of Israel. This is up on a spot uh, called Mount Arbel, and we know we're all familiar with the story of Masada, um, where the Jews made their last stand after the Romans destroyed Jerusalem. Masada was where about 900 Jews went, and they survived till about uh, AD 73. This is where the Galilean Jews fled in that same time period to Mount Arbel. And it's a very high point, very steep. And as you can see, the views are just uh, magnificent. And there's a hike that I went through there. And you you can see the steepness of the stairs. They have banisters here. But this is where the Galilean Jews hid out from the Romans. And it was so steep that they couldn't uh, access Uh, the Jews in this area. You just get a sense for the topography around the Sea of Galilee where Christ would have been uh, spending his time with his disciples, where the the rugged terrain here as he preached the gospel message. And you can see here once again the steepness of the cliff here and where the Jews would have hid themselves here. And the Romans, not to be outdone, they devised uh, wooden baskets that they lowered over the edge of the cliff so that they could uh, access the Jews. And here's the uh, baskets here that they lowered down. And so eventually they did uh, destroy the Jews in this area. The wonderful thing about Israel is we are told, you know, a rose shall bloom in a desert place. And these are just some olives on a random tree that you come across. And it just brings to mind that we know the children of Israel had been scattered for 2,000 years. They were brought back into the land as prophesied. And now there is a nation of Israel. And it's a thriving 
uh, nation at this time, and just an old olive press um, in that same area. We're going to go now to the sea, to the Jordan River. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of water, immediately he saw the heavens opened and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, Thou art my beloved Son, with thee I am well pleased. <clears throat> and so Christ himself was baptized, and we know this is an important principle to our own salvation, to be baptized into the saving name of Jesus Christ in those wonderful promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is generally believed to be the area where Christ was baptized. You would think it would be, you know, crystal clear, but it's not. It kind of has this greenish tinge to it. And there was a bunch of catfish as well that would swim up and greet you. If you want, you can pay to be baptized in this area. I took a pass on that since I already had my baptism. <clears throat> But it's just, uh, it's a very uh, tranquil place to sit and to think upon uh, Christ and his baptism here and uh, all of the teachings that he had and just to read the scriptures and to fill one's mind with those, uh, with those principles while sitting in the land of Israel. It's a very powerful uh, message. Now we're going to travel to Capernaum, the town of Jesus, which is uh, probably about a mile or two from uh, where it's believed Christ was baptized. It's interesting, you can drive around the entire Sea of Galilee in about three hours, and it's really fantastic just to uh, have the windows down in the, in the car and just drive, drive around and, and take in uh, the scenery. And these are some of the old, uh, what they believe were uh, boating ramps uh, right near the uh, synagogue where Christ would have taught. And this is believed to be the remains of the synagogue at the time of Christ. And in this area here would have been um, the healing that we read about in Peter's home. And it's generally believed that Christ did spend some time staying in Peter's home. That account is in Matthew 8. Verse 14, And when Jesus was come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever. And he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she arose and ministered unto them. And when the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. And he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. And so here we have Christ healing individuals. We know that ultimately that is the purpose of God to fill the earth with his glory and to heal all infirmities, to wipe away all tears, to have a world that is uh, emanating his righteousness in a world that is focused on goodness and mercy and kindness. And just the uh, inside uh, walls here of that sepulcher. You can see here on the, it's a little sideways, but the fourth century AD white synagogue, believed to be the synagogue where Christ taught. And so these are the original uh, stones, it's believed that was the temple, the synagogue here, that Christ would have uh, been teaching this wonderful hope of the gospel message. Now, in this area as well, you can see the remains of some of the homes there that are right in front of that synagogue in the Sea of Galilee here. Parts of the Sea of Galilee are very commercialized, and there's motor boating, water skiing, and we know that the account of Peter walking on the, the water that we read in Matthew 14, verse 29. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto him walking on the sea. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried saying, 
Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. And next time I go, I didn't have a chance to do it this time. I'm gonna, I want to paddleboard on the Sea of Galilee. I figure that's the closest that I can get to walking on water. Um, but we, we see uh, Christ here, he has the solutions to the problems of life. And by letting Christ into our lives, he will save us from the boisterous troubles of this world. And we can gain insight and knowledge to that message through our contact uh, with, with the Bible. This is the view from my, my hotel uh, room there. And I'm going to take my sports coat off. It's quite heavy, uh, hot up here. Um, and it's just fantastic view out the uh, hotel window, the, the uh, Mediterranean food here, and to just sit by the Sea of Galilee and to uh, take all of these things in. It's just, uh, it's very motivating. It's very uh, uplifting for the hope that we have. This is a little bit grainy, but the last night I was at the Sea of Galilee, I had dinner on a, a dock that went out over the Sea of Galilee, and it was just the beautiful moon rising here. And you can imagine the disciples and the time that they spent here with Christ. They were looking at that same moon over the same sea and getting all the same lessons that are available to us today. We're now going to head into Jerusalem. This is one slide that I did pull off the internet just to give us some perspective. The western wall is here. We have the Dome of the Rock. And if we were to stand on the Temple Mount and look out, we would be looking at the Mount of Olives. Um, over in this area here is um, a sheep gate. And we can read of that account in Bethesda in John chapter 5. And these are the remains um, of that area in this uh, account. And after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there who had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie, he knew that he had been now a long time in that case. He saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, we, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed, and walked. And again, we have a wonderful example. This is where they, this little sign here, says this is where the pool of Bethesda uh, was. And once again, we have Christ, he provides the healing message for the world. He provides the healing message for our lives. Look off into the distance here. You can see the dome of the rock over here. This is the Mount of Olives, Garden of Gethsemane and the Kidron Valley runs down through here. And we're going to be making our way up to this area. So here we have the Garden of Gethsemane and the path up to the top of the Mount of Olives. And if we were standing here with our backs to the Garden of Gethsemane, we'd be looking at the Dome of the Rock. The first, I've been to Israel three times. The first trip I went with my parents and my mother-in-law this is a picture of myself and my mom at the uh, Garden of Gethsemane. These olive trees are over 2,000 years old, as you can see. And when you get a close-up view in that knotty wood, 
These trees do live to be over 2,000 years old. These are generally believed to be the trees there at the time of Christ. Uh, when he would have traveled to this area with his disciples, he may have slept under these trees. Some of them are hollowed out. You could actually sleep inside um, the trees. And if you look right here, you can see there's the dome, and the rock, dome of the rock right there. And if we look at that account in Luke 22, it says, And he came out and went as he was wont to the Mount of Olives. And his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And so we know our Savior. He had the same nature that we have. He was in agony with the pressure that was on him to uh, have to go to the cross uh, for all of mankind. This is uh, just a panoramic view of that same uh, area. And you really do get a sense for uh, how old these olive trees are. Interestingly enough, they have this area all fenced off. One of the nice things when you go to Israel by yourself is that you can kind of hop from uh, one tour to another if you hear something interesting and no one seems to notice. The last morning I was here, the gate was open into the inner area of the Garden of Gethsemane. So I kind of walked in with another group and got my photo taken right next to these and kind of hung around for a little bit. And the caretaker eventually came up to me and he said, sir, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. So, but you, it's, um, it's nice to be able to kind of jump onto some of these tours and hear what the guides have to say. I thought that this really depicted what Christ went through in the garden, just the agony that he was under uh, that we uh, read about there in Luke chapter 22 and what he accomplished in his sacrifice. This path here leads up to the top of the Mount of Olives. And it's interesting because we know that David also spent time in this area. We know Christ wept in this area as he looked out at Jerusalem uh, because he was rejected. And in 2 Samuel chapter 15, we read about David weeping in this same area. And David went up by the ascent of Mount Olivet and wept as he went up and had his head covered and he went barefoot. And all the people that was with him covered every man his head and they went up weeping as they went up. And so it doesn't take long to get to the top of the Mount of Olives. Uh, this guy is always here. He wants you to take his picture and then he looks for you to give him some money. So now we're on top of the Mount of Olives and you'll notice here these are all tombs, and the Jews believe the Messiah will come in this area. And so they have a Jewish section, and they're running out of space. Um, these are all Muslim tombs over here, and there's all Christian tombs down in this area. So the Mount of Olives now is really just one big tomb. Uh, it's quite fascinating. All of these, here are some uh, Jews praying at the uh, tomb site of a loved one. But the whole site is just built up with, with tombs. They're actually building a new underground area for tombs. Uh, it's costing something like, I think it's several millions of dollars, and it will house another 50,000 or so, so many uh, individuals. Because people want to be buried in this, in this area because of the significance of it uh, with the return of of Jesus Christ. This is interesting because this is uh, Golden Gate and we know right now the Muslims have control of the uh, Temple Mount and they have sealed this gate so that no one can go through. Particularly it's been sealed because the Jews believe this is the gate that the Messiah will come through. So the Muslims have sealed it to stop that from happening. But we'll have to wait and see how successful it is 
uh, if, if uh, the bricks and mortar there will, will stop it. And you see all kinds of things like this around Israel, camels, different animals. You can get a camel ride if you want. Just to give us a perspective, we're now going to head outside the, here's the Temple Mount reconstructed by Herod. A lot of it has been uh, redone. And we're going to go out to this area here, which is believed to be the Garden Tomb. Now, modern Christianity believes that this is where Christ uh, was buried and resurrected. But a more traditional uh, spot is in this area over here. And so to the garden tomb we go. This tomb was found, it was hollowed out of a rock. It follows the account uh, that we read in Matthew. When the even was come, there was a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. And there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulcher. And so if we imagine Christ, he's been crucified, he's been taken to this tomb, and he's been laid there. And so central to our hope is his resurrection. And so they would have found this tomb empty as it is today. And this is the plaque that's on the door. He is not here for he is risen. And so that is the hope for mankind that Christ gave his life. And we have hope through him. Jesus Christ declared with power to be the son of God by the resurrection from the dead. We're now going to go up on top of the Temple Mount where we saw that uh, gold dome there. It's quite an expansive area. And if we think about, uh, this is believed to be Mount Moriah. And it's very simple why they call it the Dome of the Rock because there is a um, rock inside. It's believed to be the rock that. Uh, Isaac was going to be sacrificed on. But it's also the Muslims believe that this is where Muhammad ascended to heaven. And so that's why there is such consternation about this place because this is where Solomon's temple was, but the Muslims don't acknowledge that at all. And so they now have control of this area. You can tell this is over a thousand years old and it's quite remarkable, the structure and the intricacy of it. And the uh, Jews believe that this stone would have been in the most holy place in the temple, and that's why it's of uh, significance to them. We know in Genesis 22, we are told uh, Yahweh will provide. And uh, we are told in Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. And Jehovah Jireh, Yahweh will provide, and he did provide not only a lamb for sacrifice uh, so that Isaac was not slain, but he also has provided his son uh, for salvation. And so it's really a very uh, wonderful uh, place. You're not allowed to go into the dome unless you're Muslim. It used to be uh, 15 years ago that anyone could go in, but now that they have, uh, it's out of Jewish control, uh, you must be Muslim in order to go inside. I did try to bribe somebody up top, but um, they, they wouldn't allow it. This is uh, very interesting. There is a temple institute where they are building all of the necessary instruments for the third temple. And this is a candelabra here. It's worth over $2 million, and it is uh, placed in the Jewish quarter. And so you can go and visit the... Uh, Temple Institute and see what they're doing there and how they are looking for the Messiah and they are looking to uh, build another temple and probably seen it in the news that Jews are starting to pray up on the uh, Temple Mount again and that's creating a lot of problems with uh, the Muslim community there. 
This here is the Western Wall. It's in the news anytime a celebrity or one of our leaders goes there. They'll pray down in this area, usually stick a uh, note uh, in the wall there. You see this divider here. This is the section for men to pray. No women are allowed in that section, and this is the section where the women pray. And that's also been a point of contention because you have now the Jewish women are saying, listen, we want half, you know. We don't, we don't want this little corner over here anymore. And, you know, for uh, the bat mitzvahs, the women have to kind of peer over. They're not allowed to be over on this side. The, one of the fascinating things about this wall, this continues down under this area by about another 80 feet. And there's a tour that you can go on, and we'll see some pictures from underneath that. And there's a door right in this area here, and the wall continues. And you, you can go into that area and pray as well. But it's just a very electric place to be. When you come into this area, there's a plaque that says the presence of God dwells here, and to be respectful, you need to be covered up. You have to be dressed appropriately, but you really can feel an energy, and uh, it's, it's quite an experience. These are stones that remain from A.D. 70. When the Roman soldiers attempted to break the, the wall, the stones were too big for them to break, so they just began toppling them over, and through excavations, they've now uh, dug up these stones. These stones were covered not too long ago, but they've, um, they've excavated this whole area. So these are legitimate stones from the time of Christ that were pushed over by the Roman soldiers. And you just get a sense here for how old these stones are. The top two uh, layers here of stones are from the time of Christ. So he would have walked by this area. He would have, um, these were here at, at uh, his first coming. And uh, it's a very... Uh, sobering place, you have intense prayer going on by the Jewish people, and you really do consider the hope of Israel, God's people back in the land. This is uh, from a place called the Rooftop Walk. You can actually walk up onto the homes in this area, and it brings you out to this wonderful uh, lookout spot, and this is at the end of the Sabbath. So on Saturday night, after the sunset, Everybody comes out down to the Western Wall, all of the Jewish people, and it's like uh, a big party down there. It's just electric. And it goes on, it's midnight, and you think it's, you know, 10 in the morning. It's just, you can't, it's hard to pull yourself away from it and go back to uh, your hotel room. And this is a picture of myself with my dad uh, on the first trip that we went. You can see again the first two layers here are uh, from the time of Christ. This is uh, down below the western wall. These, uh, that wall continues down about another 80 feet and they, they've excavated all of it. These stones are massive. They don't know how they uh, got them um, into, into place. And they have some theories about that. When you go on the tour, they have these uh, pulley systems where they think they uh, got them uh, to line up. And they're offset just by a little bit so that the wall didn't tip over. <clears throat> when you go down into this area, uh, you come across this plaque that says, opposite the foundation stone in the site of the Holy of Holies. So they've excavated and the Jews try to get as close as they can to uh, where the temple was. Uh, and you have, at, at one time, the women created their own space to pray here, but not to be outdone. The men built a little uh, arch, and they, then they were praying up, you know, above where the women were. But they try to pray as close as they can to where they believe the temple was. And you get a sense here, one stone is this entire length all the way down here. And they're just massive, massive stones. And you can see this woman here uh, praying. And they have uh, soldiers that come through periodically to kick people out because you're only allowed in this area if you're on the tour and people sneak in from time to time to uh, pray. And it's, this is how you exit the area and it's, it's all the staging from the excavations. They, there's, there's 
contention with the Muslims because the Jews are trying to excavate more and more underneath where the Temple Mount is and there's been accusations that they're trying to somehow make that dome collapse and so this is one of those things why we know all nations will be gathered to Israel uh, to Jerusalem for battle when uh, Christ is at his second coming because of all these problems that exist in the land and we see it in the news every day this is a very uh, sobering place to visit the Holocaust Museum and you can spend an entire day there and it, this particular room is called the Hall of Remembrance. And these are all families and people who lost their lives in the Holocaust. And so when you stand in this room and you look around, you think about your own life and you think about the future you have for your family and for yourself and for your children. And it really makes one reflect on seizing the moment and making the very most out of the time that God has given us. These uh, stars here um, represent the Jews, one for each one million Jews that were killed in the Holocaust. And these are right outside uh, where the Western Wall is as a, as a remembrance of the Holocaust. It's, there's a lot of security. Uh, everyone in, uh, every Jewish citizen is required to um, serve in the military. I think you have to serve at least one year, so men and women. And you'll find soldiers uh, everywhere, particularly in high security areas. And you probably be less likely to start any trouble when you come across this group of of uh, soldiers and you get very used to seeing people carrying uh, assault rifles and weapons and so forth and you begin to feel very safe uh, in Jerusalem and these were some cadets that were finishing their training and they were getting ready for a celebration we're now going to move to uh, Masada and this is where the Jews made their last stand and uh, you can hike this area. This here is the snake path. And they recommend that you start early in the morning because it gets, um, it gets very warm out. By 10 o'clock in the morning, it's over 100 degrees. So they, they, they close it down usually due to uh, the heat. But I did hike up. And uh, Herod built his palaces here. There were store areas. And you can see the Dead Sea off uh, in the distance there. And so they would have enough food up here for months, many months. And that's what the Jews survived on when they uh, went to this area. This is just a um, view of one of the uh, storerooms there. This is uh, Herod's palace here, where he would, uh, the remains of it, where he would have uh, spent time in the summer. And just a wonderful view of the uh, Dead Sea. Floating in the Dead Sea is fantastic. It is true, you cannot sink. And uh, on one evening, I spent several hours just floating. And you can, obviously you can tell how young it makes you look. And you just watch the sunset and the Jordanian mountains there. And it's just uh, quite an experience. And you get the idea of people just kind of hanging out, relaxing uh, at the Dead Sea and the salt and all the products that are used. And they currently have a large project going with Jordan because the Dead Sea is evaporating. All of the water that's being used to, um, for fruit trees and for bringing, you know, making the land of Israel flourish again, it is draining from the Sea of Galilee and from the Jordan River, and so not as much water is making it down to the Dead Sea. So they have a multi-million dollar project to bring water from the Red Sea into the Dead Sea to try to disband some of this. Many of the hotels that were built right on the shoreline, they're now half a mile from the shore, so you need to take a shuttle bus down to uh, where the Dead Sea is. This is a life-size uh, setup of the uh, tabernacle that you can visit and get a tour. Um, 
And that was, was a lot of fun to kind of see that. And they, they've tried to make it as real as possible. The, the, the giveaway is the ventilation system here uh, coming down. But it was uh, a nice tour. And you get a sense for how the children of Israel in their wanderings to set this up, to break it down and uh, worshiping back at those times. We're going to conclude our tour in um, the next few slides. This is in the En Gedi area. And you go from the desert there with the Dead Sea, you hike up about, oh, I don't know, half a mile, and you come upon these lush waterfalls, and uh, it's very fertile. And we read of an account there with David in 1 Samuel 23. And David went up from thence and dwelt in strongholds at En Gedi. And it came to pass, when Saul was returned from following the Philistines, that it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. And he came to the sheep coats by the way, where was a cave, and Saul went in to cover his feet. And David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. And the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. And so David would have hid out in this area uh, where the Dead Sea was up here uh, with his soldiers hiding from Saul. And uh, it's just a really interesting uh, place to spend time. You have all these pools of water and waterfalls. And when you get out of that fertile area, the, the waterfalls are down in here, but when you hike up to the top, you have this wonderful view of the Jordanian Mountains and of the Dead Sea right here. And we'll conclude our tour uh, with an account from Judges of Gideon in Judges chapter 6. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. Bring them down unto the water, and I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, This shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And of whomsoever I say unto thee, This shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. And we know that those that lap the water with their tongue as a dog lapped, they were set aside. And the lesson there for us is to constantly be putting the water of the word into our lives. And so as we consider our time and we think upon the wonderful hope of the gospel message, the hope of Israel, the promises that were made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the promise that Christ will come again and establish a worldwide government of peace. May we consider these things and be built up in the message that God has provided to us in the gospel.